Dublin was a dying town in the 1980s. Decay and dereliction disfigured its streets. In this dismal era of a depressed economy and mass emigration, some spotted opportunities. A desperate government brought in tax incentives to foster inner city renewal. The monks still had a lot of stolen cash to dispose of. And in this grim climate, he was the wrong man, in the right place, at the right time. Paddy Shanahan and Matty Kelly were gangsters with a flair for business and an eye for a deal. They acted as frontmen for Hutch in a number of property ventures, which allowed the monk not only to wash the funds from various robberies, but also gave a steady stream of legitimate income. Matty Kelly was the most interesting man. He had an amazing powers of recollection and perception. And of course, he made very substantial good investments. Part of the difficulty surrounding Matty Kelly was for all of the material times that he had assembled this great wealth, he was an undischarged bankrupt. Matt Kelly was unable to officially own property because he was a bankrupt. There was a large amount of money to be infiltrated into a building. Patrick Shanahan and his companies were the way to go. Hutch, Kelly and Shanahan formed a corrupt syndicate. The monk came up with the dirty money, Kelly came up with the dubious property, and Shanahan provided cover for the entire enterprise. In the top end of Buckingham Street, there was a site which Jerry Hutch had identified, and with the assistance and with the scheming of Patrick Shanahan and Matt Kelly, this site was purchased. A building company was formed, and Patrick Shannon took on the responsibility of developing the site. They built a number of apartments there. This was ideal for Jerry Hutch to conceal his money. He was able to pour cash monies into this development and get it up and running. Other senior crime figures also got in on the scam. George Mitchell, the Penguin, was just one of many who put his name down for a piece of the action. Now, it was a bitter irony that the gangsters from the ghettos were to be the first to invest in the inner city before the property boom. This ugly edifice, called Buckingham Village, was built on the proceeds of drug trafficking, smuggling and armed robberies. 100 new apartments went up and provided a grotty haven for asylum seekers. Hutch and company were landlords, with tenants whose rent was paid every week by the Eastern Health Board. Now the state was effectively washing the monk's dirty money and paying top dollar for the privilege. No wonder he had plenty to smile about. Two months after the murder of the general Martin Cahill, someone with a grievance also shot Paddy Shanahan. Another corporate gangland dispute solved from the barrel of a gun. Gardy still believed Shanahan's murder was organised by a gangster who had also been using his business to launder dirty money. Now, the murder greatly upset Hutch. Apart from being a good friend, Shanahan had been an invaluable ally to him. Post the murder of Patrick Shanahan, Jerry Hutch was faced with the dilemma of how was he going to identify to the Shanahan estate that he was owed a large amount of monies. A year before his murder, Paddy Shanahan fronted the construction of an upmarket apartment complex in Stephen Street in Dublin. Hutch had secretly invested in the project at Drury Hall and faced losing it all now that his buddy was dead. He stood to lose 180,000, which he had passed to Patrick Shanahan's companies to start the development. I would say that Jerry Hutch walked away from that monies and forgot about it because it would have unearthed maybe stones that he did not want on earth at all. Now faced with a major cash crisis, Hutch went back to what he did best, Robin. After months of meticulous planning, Jerry Hutch and his gang made their move on the night of January 24th, 1995. They had inside information, they knew what time a van laden with cash was going to return to the Brinks Allied Depot in Clanshock. Now, the gang using two stolen Jeeps and cover of darkness 
gained access to the rear of the building via the old M1 motorway, which was under construction at the time. They had breached several ditches in fields along the way, and they drove up to the perimeter fence. Overnight, they had weakened the fence, and when the order came to move, they got a signal from outside the depot. A flare was fired when the cash van arrived. They burst in. Within seconds, three to four masked men with firearms, guns blazing, entered and stole a large amount of monies. The jeeps that were used to ram the, the center were abandoned. Two other jeeps were loaded with cash. When they left, they had 3.6 million euro in cash. It was the biggest cash robbery in the history of the state. In fact, Jerry Hutch had just excelled himself. He had been responsible for two of the biggest cash robberies in Irish history. Well, I was only in the ministry about three weeks uh, when in January of 1995, the Brinks Allied robbery took place. And that was about three, over three million euros, which now seems a tiny amount of money, but it was a very big robbery at that time. And it meant that from the word go, I was kind of on the back foot. Hutch scarpered to Florida to lie in the sun while the heat died down. But everyone at home wanted to know who was responsible for this mega heist. The police knew the Kulak job bore all the hallmarks of Jerry Hutch, but no one was ever charged or convicted for this raid. To this day, not a penny has been recovered. At the time, the Sunday World put a face on the mastermind, and as a result, Veronica Gearn was given an interview with the man himself. He denied he was responsible, but wished the robbers the very best of luck. When Veronica asked Hutch where he got his money from, he ended the interview on a memorable note. He said, it's none of your business. My philosophy in life is simple. No betrayal, you don't talk about others, you don't grass, and you never let people down. A year later, Jerry Hutch queued with hundreds of ordinary, decent citizens to sign the book of condolence for Veronica Gearn. Standing in line, he must have sensed a palpable change in public mood. He knew then that her killers had overplayed their hand. The murder of Veronica would lead to the creation of the Criminal Assets Bureau and turn Jerry Hutch's world upside down. I knew that we had a serious problem out there in what was euphemistically called ordinary decent crime. The Al Capone example would be thrown up. Over 10 years, I heard people talking about why can't we get these people like Al Capone was got for not paying his taxes. Everybody realised that to follow up an organised crime, you've got to follow the money. You've got to get that and where it really hurts. And hence, the urgency to create a bureau or an agency or a unit that would chase the money, the acquisition of wealth, of these people involved in this type of crime. That is where the Criminal Assets Bureau came from and why we were able to do it then, because the people understood that things had to be done. We were bringing in something that would hopefully save lives, save people from being the victims of criminal activity. From the beginning, one Gerard Hutch, alias the Monk, will be one of the primary targets of a dedicated team of investigators. <laughs> 